Welcome back to Lily's Viking Adventures. Today we're going to talk about some primordial goddesses. The, the earth deep dive into these impressive deities and female ones. I like that. Thanks for joining me. This is going to be a long one, so get yourself a snack, a drink, hit the sub button. Let's do this thing. All right, so chaos. Chaos is often considered the starting point. Described as feminine, chaos represents the swirling mixture of elemental mass that existed before anything else. Initially, chaos was associated with the lower atmosphere, the air that surrounded the living world. Later, interpretations expanded her role to make her the progenitor of all primordial gods. Birds, insects, and other flying creatures were her first mortal children. So here we've got something from Africa, Akan mythology. Asesya, the goddess of the harsh earth, truth, and the mother of the dead, an ancient religious figure worshipped by the indigenous Akan people of the Guinea coast. Asesya is also known as Abruruwa, which is a con for old woman. Not only is she an earth goddess, she also represents procreation, truth, love, fertility, peace, and the earth of the Akan. Asais Afua, the goddess of the lush earth, fertility, love, procreation, and farming. There's another one there. Next one is one of my personal favorites, Jord. She is the personification of Earth and a goddess in Norse mythology. She is the mother of the thunder god Thor and a sexual partner of Odin. Jord is attested in Danish histori history Gesta Denorum, composed in the 12th century by Danish historian Saxo Grammaticus. The poetic Edda compiled in the 13th century by an unknown individual or individuals and the prose Edda also composed in the 13th century. Her name is often employed in skaldic poetry and kennings as a poetic term for land or earth. Old Norse Jord means earth and land, serving both as a common noun, earth, and as a theonymic inca incarnation of the pronoun of the noun earth goddess. It stems from Proto-Germanic, Yurpo, earth, soil, land, as evidenced by the Gothic Arfa, Old English or Yurp, Old Saxon, Ertha, or Old High German, Erta, the ancient Greek word Era, Ifa, earth, is also probably related. The word is most likely cognate with Proto-Germanic Irwa or Irwan, meaning sand, soil, Old Norse Jurfi, sand, gravel, Og, Ero, earth. Alternative names, Fjörgen, is considered by scholars to be another name of Jord. She is similarly described as Thor's mother, and her name is also used as a poetic synonym for land or the earth in skaldic poems. The name Hljóðin, mentioned in Voluspa, as son of Hljóðin for Thor, sorry, I cannot pronounce all of these, is most likely also used as a synonym for Hjord. The etymology of Hlothin remains unclear, although it is often thought to be related to the goddess Hludana, to whom Romano-Germanic votive tablets have been found on the Lower Rhine. Attestations. Gesta Denorum. Hjord receives mention in Danish historian Saxo Grammaticus's Gesta Denorum as Luritha. Poetic Edda. Jord receives mention in poems Voluspa and Locasena. In Voluspa, Thor is referred, referred to as Mogir, Hlodinar, and Fjörginar, Burr. 
child of Hlothen, Fjorgen's child. Hlothen, although etymolo etymologically unclear, must therefore have been another name for Jord. In Locusina, Thor is called Hjarthar Burr, son of Jord. Prosetta. Jord is attested to in the Prosetta books, Gilfaginning and Skalska Parmal. According to section 10 of the Gilfaginning, additionally, the section describes Jord's ancestry as follows. The included note is Falk's own. Falk uses anglicized Lord throughout this edition of the Prosetta. Section 25 of the Gelfaginning lists Jord among the Ansjurer, Old Norse goddesses, singular Ansia. Thor's mother, Lord, and Vali's mother, Rind, are reckoned among the Ansjurer. Skaldska Parmal mentions Jord numerous times, including in several quotes from skaldic poetry. The second section four of the book lists kinnings for the god Thor, including son of Odin and Lord. Section 17 quotes Pjordjöfr of Hevinir's composition Haustlong, in which the skald refers to Thor as the son of Lord twice. The poem is quoted again in section 23. Section 18 quotes Ilifir Godersen's composition Forstrapa, in which the skald refers to Thor as Lord's son. Section 19 contains a list of kennings for the goddess Frigg, including Rival of Lord and Rind and Gunlod and Gerd. Section 90 contains a list of kennings for Jord, referencing a variety of skaldic kennings for the goddess. How shall Earth be referred to? By calling it Ynamir's flesh and mother of Thor, daughter of Onar, bride of Odin, rival of Frigg and Rind and Gunlod, mother-in-law of Sif, floor and base of winds, hall, sea of animals, daughter of night, sister of Odd and Day. The section contains quotes from poems by Halfredir, Vandredskald, and pure the fur, pure of Havnir. Just can't do that one, I guess. My tongue won't do it. The half now clearer section of Skaldspa Parmal includes Jord in a list of Asinjur names. Additionally, as the common noun Jord is also simply means earth, references the earth. References to the earth occur throughout the prose edda. Okay. Paka Mama is the mother earth goddess of the Andean people. She embodies nourishment and abundance and encompasses all of creation, similar to the Greek goddess Gaia. She is associated with rituals of, for fertility, protection, and healthy crops. Those who venerate her typically leave offerings of food, tobacco, alcohol, and cocoa leaves. Gaia. We've all heard of this one. Gaia, also known as Mother Earth, emerged from chaos. She is the primordial goddess of the world and is associated with fertility and nurturing the earth. Gaia is considered the ancestral mother of all life. Her domain encompasses the entire planet and all living things that inhabit it. The most well-known of the primordial gods were the first to have a physical presence. Gaia is often referred to as Earth Mother, as the primordial goddess of the world. She was the mother of all living things that came to inhabit it. Gaia was also one of the only primordial gods to be routinely shown with an anthropomorphic form and a distinct personality. She appeared in art as a female figure emerging from the ground. While she was never entirely separate from the earth, she could be shown in a more relatable way. Gaia also featured prominently in many myths. She was portrayed as a protective maternal figure who would do great 
who would go to great lengths, including violence, to protect her children. We can all relate with that, can't we? Gaia's first child emerged from her being soon after she was formed. This was Uranus, the god of the heavens, who became her spouse. Together, Uranus and Gaia became the parents of the Titans, the first Cyclopses and the Hecaton Chires. These were the first gods to be born from a union between two other beings rather than spontaneously. Uranus, however, was not a good father to his children. He despised the Cyclops and the Hecaton Chires for their monstrous appearances and had them imprisoned in the one place Gaia could not reach them. Beneath the flat expanse of Gaia, another primordial being had taken shape. This was Tartarus, the pit. Tartarus was a bleak and brutal place, while Gaia was a place of life. Tartarus was a realm of death. The pit curved beneath Gaia in a semicircle. While they met at their edges, there was no way for Gaia to see into Tartarus, because he was beneath her surface. Uranus locked his six children in the depths of Tartarus, giving preference to the more attractive titans. This enraged Gaia, however, and she asked her children to help her protect their siblings. When the titans rebelled against Uranus, they held him aloft so he could no longer touch Gaia. With this, the heavens became a dome above the earth, mirroring the curve of Tartarus and making the physical world a complete sphere. These primordial gods set the stage for the subsequent generations of gods in Greek mythology, shaping the cosmos and the forces that govern it. Their influence reverberates throughout ancient tales and continues to captivate our imagination today. Sibylle Phrygian Matar Kubalaya Kubalaye Mother, perhaps Mountain Mother Lydian Kuvava, Greek Kubien Kybele, is an Anatolian mother goddess. She may have been possible forerunner in the earliest Neolithic at the Katahulik, Huic. She is Phrygia's only known goddess and was probably its national deity. Greek colonists in Asia Minor adopted and adapted her Phrygian cult and spread it to mainland Greece and to the more distant western Greek colonies around the 6th century. So apparently Rome wasn't the only one who stole other people's religions. In Greece, Sibylle met with a mixed reception. She became partially assimilated to aspects of the Mother Earth goddess Gaia. Of her possibly Minoan equivalent Rhea, and of the harvest mother goddess Demeter. Some city-states, notably Athens, evoked her as a protector, but her most celebrated Greek rites and processions show her as an essentially foreign, exotic mystery goddess who arrives in a lion-drawn chariot to the accompaniment of wild music, wine, and a disorderly ecstatic following. Uniquely in Greek religion, she had a eunuch mendicant priesthood. Many of her Greek cults included rights to a divine Phrygian castrate shepherd consort Attis, who was probably a Greek invention. In Greece, Sibylle became associated with mountains, town and city walls, fertile nature, and wild animals, especially lions. In Rome, Sibylle became known as Magena Mater, Great Mother, the Roman state adopted and developed a particular f- form of her cult after the Sibylline Oracle in 205 BC recommended her conscription as a key religious ally in Rome's second war against Carthage, 218 to 201 BC. Roman mythographers reinvented her as a Trojan goddess and thus an ancestral goddess of the Roman people by way of the Trojan prince, prince Aeneas. As Rome eventually established hegemony over the Mediterranean world, Romanized forms of Sibylle's cult spread throughout Rome's empire, 
Greek and Roman writers debated and disputed the meaning and morality of her cults and priesthoods, which remain controversial subjects in modern scholarship. Bumi, also known, known as Budevi, is the personification of Earth as a goddess in Hinduism. According to Hindu mythology, Varaha, the third avatar incarnation of the god Vishnu, saved her from the Asura Hiranyaska, Yash, Yaksasha, and married her. Again, I apologize for my mispronunciations. I do my best. She is regarded as the mother of Narakasara, Mangala, and Sita. The Vedic precursor of Bhumi seems to have been Prithvi, the primordial goddess of the Rigveda. In Suri Vaishnava tradition, Budevi is considered as the second aspect of Vishnu's consort, Lakshmi, along with the aspects of Siradevi and Nila Devi. The name Bhumi is the Sanskrit word for earth. The version Puhumi is the equivalent in Old Awadi. Her birth. Varying accounts of Bhumi's birth are narrated in Hindu scriptures. The southern recension of the epic Mahabharata mentions Bhumi as the daughter of the creator god Brahma. The Devi Bhagavata Purana states her to be born out of the remains of two Rakashas, Madhu and Kaitaba. Bhumi is the consort of the anthropomorphic Varaha, an avatar of the preserver god Vishnu, according to the Puranas, during the Satya Yuga, first eon, the demon Hiranyaksha kidnapped Bhumi and hid her in the primordial waters. Upon the request of the gods, Vishnu took the avatar incarnation of Varaha to rescue her. Varaha slew the demon and retrieved the earth from the depths of the ocean, lifting it on his tusks. He restored Bhumi to her rightful place in the universe and proceeded to marry her. The episode of the Devas seeking the assistance of Vishnu's Varaha avatar in rescuing Bhumi is described in the Padma Purana. They sought the shelter of Naranyana Vishnu, then knowing that wonder he, Vishnu, the holder of a conch, a disc, and a mace, took up the boar form existing everywhere and having no beginning, middle, or end, the highest Lord, full of everything, having hands and feet on all sides, having large fangs and arms, struck the demon with one fang. The mean son of Diti, with his huge body pounded, died. Seeing the earth fallen from the demon's head, he lifted it with his fang and putting it on Sessa's head as before, took up the form of a tortoise. Seeing the great Visnu of the form of the hog, all deities and sages with their bodies bowed with devotion praised him. Key. This is a Sumerian goddess and she was the earth goddess in the Sumerian religion, chief consort of the sky god An. In some legends, Ki and An were brother and sister. This happens a lot. There's a lot of that about incesty. Uh, being the offspring of Ashna, Ashar, sky pivot, and Kishar, earth pivot. Earlier personifications of the heavens and earth. By her consort Anu, also known as Anuna, Ki gave birth to Anunnaki. The most prominent of these deities being Enlil, god of the air, according to the legends, the heavens and earth were once inseparable until Enlil was born. Enlil cleaved the heavens and earth in two and carried away the heavens. Ki, in company with Enlil, took the earth. Ki marries her son, Enlil, and from this union, 
all the plant and animal life on earth is produced. Some authorities question whether Ki was regarded as a deity since there is no evidence of a cult, and the name appears only in a limited number of Sumerian creation texts. Samuel Noah Kramer identifies Ki with the Sumerian mother goddess Nidhursag and claims that they were originally the same figure. She later developed into the Babylonian and Akkadian goddess Antu, consort of the god Anu. Ki was the wife and chief consort of Anu, the god of the sky. They are thought to be brother and sister who could who could be both offspring of the god named Anshar, the sky pivot, and Kassar, the earth pivot, making Anshar and Kassar her mother and father. Ki was a mother to one who was named Enlil. Her son, Enlil, the god of air, was part of the Anunnaki. Ki ends up marrying her son, Enlil, and according to the myth, this was how the plants and animals were created on earth. Okay, Zem, Zemina, or Zemainli, from Lithuanian, is the goddess of the earth in Lithuanian religion. She is usually regarded as mother goddess and one of the chief Lithuanian gods similar to Latvian Zimismate. Zemaina personifies fertile earth and nourishes all life on earth, human, plant, and animal. All that is born of earth will return to earth, thus her cult is also related to death. As the cult diminished after baptism of Lithuania, Zemaina's image and functions became influenced by the cult of Virgin Mary. Zemaina stems from the name of Proto-Indo-European earth goddess, Demogum. It relates to Thracian Zemeli, Mother Earth, and Greek Simeli. Zemina was first mentioned by Jan Lassiki, 1582. It was later also described by Mika Lojus Duska, 1595, Daniel Klein, 1653, Matthias Pretorius, Jacob Brodowski, 1740, and in numerous folk legends, beliefs, and prayers. Pretorius described a ritual called Zema Uti performed at major celebrations or agricultural works. The head of the household would drink a cup of beer, but first he would spill some of the drink on the ground and say a short prayer. Then he would kill a rooster or a hen, which would be cooked and eaten by the entire family. Each family member would receive a loaf of bread and say prayers, blessings, and greetings. The bones and other scraps would be sacrificed to the goddess, burned or buried. Other recorded rites included burying bread baked from last crop of prior harvest in a field before new sowing, very specific, and sacrifice of a black piglet. People would also kiss the earth, saying a short prayer thanking Zemaina for all her gifts and acknowledging that one day they will return to her. Memento Mori. People addressed Zemina in various affectionate diminutive names and epithets. That's cute. I wonder which ones. I wish they had listed it. I'll have to go find that out. In addition, historical sources on Baltic mythology describe the dual role of goddess Zemina. While she was connected to the fertility of the land, she was also connected with receiving the dead and acting as their ruler and guardian. So, um, both mother goddess and kind of like hell, also. Pieces of Lithuanian folklore also make references to Earth as mother of humans and their final abode after death. The goddess is said to be married to either Perkunus, thunder god, or Pramzius, manifestation of chief heavenly god Daivis. Thus the couple formed the typical Indo-European pair of Mother Earth and Father Sky. It was believed that the Earth needs to be fertilized by the heavens. Okay, Danu, Irish goddess. 
Danu is a hypothesized entity in Irish mythology whose sole attestation is in the genitive in the name of the Tuatha de Danann, which may mean the peoples of the goddess Danu in Old Irish. Despite her complete absence from the primary texts, some later Victorian folklorists attempted to ascribe certain attributes to Danu, such as association with motherhood or agricultural prosperity. The hypothetical nominative form of the name Danu is not found in any medieval Irish text, but is rather a reconstruction by modern scholars based on the genitive Danan, also spelled Danand or Danand, which is the only form attested in the primary sources. In the collective name of the Irish gods, Tuatha de, de Danan, tribe, people of Danu, in Irish mythology, Anu, sometimes written Anan or Anand, is a goddess. She may be a distinct goddess in her own right or an alternative name for Danu, in which case Danu could be a contraction of Di Anu, goddess Anu. The etymology of the name has been a matter of much debate since, since the 19th century, with some earlier scholars favoring a link with the Vedic water god goddess Danu, whose name is derived from the Proto-Indo-European -Indo root Denhu, to run, to flow, which may also lie behind the ancient name for the river Danube, Danuius, perhaps of Celtic origin, though it is also possible that it is an early Scythian loanword in Celtic. MacLeod connects Danu to the old Irish word dan, which refers to an artistic skill. In early Ireland, artisans and other skilled workers were known as Asa Dana, or people of skill. Linguist Eric Hamp rejects the traditional etymologies in his 2002 examination of the name Danu and proposes, instead, Danu is derived from the same root as Latin bonus old word duinos, from Proto-Indo-European duino, good, via a Proto-Celtic nominative singular in stem, duanu, aristocrat. Danu has no surviving myths or legends associated with her in any of the medieval Irish texts. Approximate matches Anu and Danand in Irish texts. Cormac's Glossary, a text that predates the Labor Gabala Erin, names the goddess Anu as the mother of the gods. Some scholars suggest that Danu was a conflation of Anu and is the same goddess. This may also connect Danu to the Morrigan, which some scholars say is an epithet for Anu. The closest figure in Irish texts to a Danu would be Denand, daughter of Dalbaith, in the Labor Gabala Eren, the Book of the Taking of Ireland. It is noted that Tuatha de Danann get their name from Denand and Dalbaith's three sons, Brian, Lucar, and Lucarba. These three are called the gods of Danann. MacLeod notes that Danu's three sons might be better fit by the craftsman deities Goib Niu, Lukta, and Kregne, and suggests that the gods of Danu may refer to them. Danu's association with fertility can be seen in the relation of Pops of Danu, also known as the Pops of Anu. Pops meaning breasts. Another possible match is in the Dinsinasha poem on Kodal, which refers to Danian, wife of Ganon. Danian is the mother of a daughter named Gorn. Some texts list Danu as the Bantutach, witch or sorceress, or Bandrui, female druid, of the Tuath de Danan. Welsh parallels. She has possible parallels with the Welsh legendary figure Don in medieval tales of Mabingion, whom most modern scholars consider to be the mythological mother goddess, 
This may be supported by theories that Don name may also come from a root referring to. However, Don's gender is not specified in the Mabingian. Mabinogian. And some medieval Welsh antiquarian ant antiquarians presumed Don to be male. Don's divine offspring include Gefanan, the Welsh equivalent to Goi Goibniu. Okay. Aka. Aka is a female spirit in Sami shamanism and Finnish and Estonian mythology. Her worship is common and took the forms of sacrifice, prayer, and various other rituals. Some Sami believe she lived under their tents, as with other gods. Her name appears within some geographical names, leaving a legacy of Sami presence. Sami mythology. Madaraka, the first Aka, was mother of the tribe, goddess of women and children, she who gives humans their bodies. Women and girls belong to her, as do boys until they are declared men. Madaraka is popular among modern Sami feminists. Her three daughters are Saraka, the goddess of fertility, menstruation, love, human sexuality, pregnancy, and childbirth. After a birth, a woman would eat a special porridge dedicated to Saraka. The modern Sami woman's organization, the Saraka, formed in 1988 and is named in honor of her. Juksaka, Aka with an arrow, the protector of children. Uksaka, Aka of the door, who shapes the fetus in the mother's womb and assigns humans their sexes. Ja, Jabmi Aka, the Aka of the dead, is the goddess of the underworld. She soothes the spirits of dead babies, but all other spirits dwell in sorrow. Her land of the dead is said to mirror the land of the living, where everything is opposite, so the dead are buried with the essentials of living, and anything that would make their afterlife better. Finnish and Estonian mythologies. In Finnish mythology, Aka is the wife of Uku and is the goddess of fertility. As they make love, thunder rolls. She can be seen as the female side of nature. Maimonen, Mother Earth, whom Uku for fertilizes. In Estonian mythology, she is known as Ma Emma. In Germanic paganism, Nerthus is a goddess associated with a ceremonial wagon procession. Nerthus is attested by 1st century AD Roman historian Tacitus in his ethnographic work Germania. In Germania, Tacitus records that a group of Germanic peoples were particularly distinguished by their veneration of the goddess. Tacitus describes the wagon procession in some detail. Nerthus's cart is found on an unspecified island in the ocean, where it is kept in a sacred grove and draped in white cloth. Only a priest may touch it. When the priest detects Nerthus's presence by the cart, the cart is drawn by heifers. Nerthus's cart is met with celebration and peacetime everywhere it goes. And during her procession, no one goes to war and all iron objects are locked away. In time, after the goddess has had her fill of human company, the priest returns, to, returns the cart to her temple, and slaves ritually wash the goddess, her cart, and the cloth in the secluded lake. According to Tacitus, the slaves are then immediately drowned in the lake. Whew, that's dramatic. Okay. Scholars have linked Tacitus' description of ceremonial wagons found from around Tacitus' time until the Viking Age, particularly the Germanic Iron Age, Dehebirg wagon in Denmark, and the Viking Oseberg ship burial wagon in Norway. The goddess named Nerthus from Proto-Germanic is the early Germanic etymological precursor to the Old Norse deity named Njörtr a male deity who is comparably associated with wagons and water in Norse mythology. Together with his children, Freya and Freyr, the three form the Vanir family of gods. 
The Old Norse record contains three narratives featuring ritual wagon processions that scholars have compared to Tacitus' description of Nerthus wagon procession, one of which, and potentially all of them, focus on Nord's son, Freyr. Additionally, scholars have sought to explain the difference in sex between the early Germanic and Old Norse forms of the deity, discussed potential etymological connections to the obscure female deity named Njörun, mention of the mysterious sister-wife of Njörður, proposed a variety of locations for where the procession may have occurred, generally in Denmark, and considered Tacitus' sources for his description. Tacitus, Tacitus's Nerthus has had some influence on popular culture, and in particular the now widely rejected manuscript reading of Hertha in Germany. Germania. Tacitus's sources. Tacitus does not provide information regarding his sources for the description of Nerthus, nor the rest of Germania. Tacitus's account may stem from earlier but now lost literary works, such as perhaps Pliny the Elder's lost Bella Germanae. Potentially his own experiences in Germania were merchants and soldiers, such as Germanic peoples in Rome or Germania, and Romans who spent time in the region. Tacitus's Germania places particular emphasis on the Simones, and scholars have suggested that some or all of Tacitus's information may come from King Messias of the Simones, and or his high priestess, the seeress Ghana. The two visited Rome for a blessing from the Roman Emperor Domitian in 92 AD. While Tacitus appears to have been away from Rome during this period, he would have had plenty of opportunity to gain information provided by King Masaeus or Ghana from those who spent time with the two during their visit. In 1902, the Codex Asinus, often abbreviated, was discovered and it was also found to contain the form Nertum, yielding the reading Nerthus. The Codex Asinus is a 15th century composite manuscript that is considered a direct copy of the Codex Hersefeldinus the oldest identifiable manuscript of the text. All other manuscripts of Tacitus Germania are thought by scholars to stem from the Codex Asinaeus. Some scholars have continued suggesting alternate readings to Nerthus. For example, in 1992, Lot Motz proposes that the linguistic correspondence is a co coincidence and that the variant Nertum was chosen by Grimm because it corresponds to Njord. Instead, Motz proposed that various female entities from the continental Germanic folklore record, particularly those in central Germany and the Alps, stem from a single source, who she identifies as Nerthus, and that migrating Germanic peoples brought the goddess to those regions from coastal Scandinavia. After her death, Motz's proposals receive support from Rudolf Simic. John Lindau rejects Motz's proposal and Simic's support. He highlights the presence of the form in the Codus Asinaeus, discovered in 1902 while Grimm died in 1863, and asks, would it not be an extraordinary coincidence that a deity who fits the pattern of the later fertility gods should have a name that is etymologically identical with one of them? So that's interesting. Difference in sex between Nerthus and Njörður. Although Njörður etymologically descends from Nerthus, Tacitus describes Nerthus female, while the Old Norse deity Njörður as male. The form Nerthus does indicate whether the deity was considered male or female. This difference in sex between the two has resulted in significant discussion from scholars. A variety of reasons for this difference have been proposed. 
Over the years, scholars have variously proposed that Nerthus was likely one of a pair of deities in a manner similar to Njordr's incestuous children, Freyr and Freya, perhaps involving Hyros Gamos. That Nerthus was a hermaphroditic deity, that the deity's sex simply changed from male to female over time, or that Tacitus's account mistakes Nerthus for a female deity rather than a male deity. Others have proposed that a female Njordr continues the Old Norse corpus as a sister wife of Njordr and or the goddess named Njorren. There is a wagon on display at the National Museum of Denmark found deposited in a peat bog in Denmark and dating from around Tacitus's time. There is also uh, one that came from the Osseberg burial, and that is in the Osseberg Museum. In Norse mythology, Njordr is strongly associated with water, and he and his children, Freyr and Freya, are particularly associated with wagons. Together, his family is known in Ord Old Norse as the Vanir. Njordr is referred to as a god of wagons, Old Norse Vangagut, in the principal manuscript of Skalsparamal, the Codex Regis. Uh, let's see. Bog bodies. Sorry, I lost my place. Bog bodies. The face of the Toland man, a well-preserved, richly deposited bog body found in Denmark dated the 4th century BC. Known as bog bodies, numerous well-preserved human remains have been found in peat bogs in northern Europe. Like the wagons interred in peat bogs discussed above, these bodies were intentionally and ritually placed. Various scholars have linked Tacitus' description of drowned slaves in a lake as a reference to the interment of human corpses in peat bogs. For example, according to archaeologist Peter Wilhelm Glob, the description of the goddess, goddess's attendance in the lake on the completion of the ritual recalls, or the rites, recalls the sacrificed bog people. There is indeed much to suggest that the bog people were participants in ritual celebrations of this kind, which culminated in their death and disposition in the bogs. All right. On to Sibylle, Mother Earth, the Roman cult of Sibylle, a depiction of the Phygerian goddess Sibylle with a chariot led by cats dated to 3rd century BC. In his description of Nerthus, Tacitus refers to the goddess as Mother Earth, Terra Mater. This has been received by scholars in a variety of ways and impacted early manuscript readings of the deity's name, especially Hertham. See the name and manuscript variation, variation section above. In his assessment of the Old Norse personification of Earth, Jord, a goddess in Norse mythology, McKinnell says that the Old Norse personification does not appear to be notably connected to the Vanir, Norther, or Nerthus. He concludes that it seems likely that Tacitus equates Nerthus with Terra Mater as an interpretation interp Interpretation Romania, a translation into terms his Roman readers would find familiar. John Lidow says that Tacitus' identification with Mother Earth probably has much less to do with Jord in Scandinavian mythology than with fertility goddesses in many cultures. The Phrygian goddess Sibylle has been absorbed into the Roman pantheon by Tacitus's time, and Tacitus himself served as a priest in the cult of Sibylle which included duties such as washing a sacred cult stone. Similar to Tacitus' description of Nerthus, Sibylle was at times closely connected to, or conflated with, the concept of Terra Mater, Mother Earth. Through her identity as Mater Diem, Mother of the Gods, and was at times depicted with a chariot pulled by lions. Okay, here's some Slavic. 
Slavic goddess. Mat Zemaila. Zemlaya. Matka Zemya, Matushka Zem Zemya is the moist or water earth mother and is probably the oldest deity in Slavic mythology besides Marzana. She is also called Matya Sirya, Zemla, meaning mother damp earth or mother moist earth. Her identity later blended into that of Mokash. In early Middle Ages, Matya Sirya Zemla was one of the most important deities in the Slavic world. Slavs made oaths by touching the earth, and sons were confessed into a hole in the earth before death. She was worshipped in her natural form and was not given a human personage or likeness. Since the adoption of Christianity in all Slavic lands, she has been identified with Mary, the mother of Jesus. An example of her importance is seen in, the, in this traditional invocation to Matka Zimya, made with a jar of hemp oil. East, Mother Earth, subdue every evil and unclean being so that he may not cast a spell on us, nor do us any harm. West, Mother Earth, engulf the unclean power in thy boiling pits and in thy burning fires. South, Mother Earth, calming the winds coming from the south in all bad weather, calm the moving sands and whirlwinds. North, Mother Earth, calm the north winds and clouds, subdue the snowstorms and the cold. The jar which held the oil is buried after each invocation and offering is made at each quarter. Old Slavic beliefs seem to attest some awareness of an ambivalent nature of the earth. It was considered men's cradle and nurturer during one's lifetime, and when the time of death came it would open up to receive their bones as if it were a return to the womb. The imagery of terra humide, moist earth, also appears in funeral lamentations, either as a geographical feature, as in Lithuanian and Ukrainian lamentations, or invoked as mera terra humidi, mother moist earth. Cultic practices. Up until World War I and the fall of the Russian Empire, peasant women would perform a rite to prevent against plague by plowing a furrow around the village and calling on the protection of the earth spirits by shrieking. In the religion and mythology of the ancient... Oh, that's it. Okay, that's it for the Slavic one. Now we're on to the Hawaiian one. In the religion and mythology of the ancient Hawaiians, Papa Hana Moku, often simply called Papa, is a goddess and the earth mother. She is mentioned in the chants as a consort of the sky god Wakea. And you see this over and over again, earth, uh, earth mother, sky god, sky father. Their daughter is beautiful goddess Ho'oho Kukalani, the main character of one myth. Papa is worshipped by some Hawaiians, especially by women, as a primordial force of creation who has the power to give life and to heal. The Northwestern Hawaiian Islands Marine National Monument was renamed in 2007 to Papa Hana U Mokukia Marine National Monument in honor of Papa mythology. In the Hawaiian religion, Papa Hanoumoku is the mother of the islands and creator of life. According to the ancient myths, Papa is the wife of Wakia, son of the god Kahiko. Wakia is the f sky, father sky in the Hawaiian religion and a personification of the male creative power he and Papa are representations of the divine masculinity and femininity. Together they created the Hawaiian Islands and became the ancestors of the Hawaiian chiefs and noblemen. The most important offspring of Papa are the islands called Hawaii, the Big Island, Maui, Ohu, and Kauai. Chiefs claimed their descent from Papa and it was believed they were divine as well. The most famous child of Wakia and Papa is 
Ho'ohoku Kalani, and she became Wakia's lover, according to the famous myth. Ho'ohoku Kalani gave birth to a stillborn baby. It was Papa who named the child Haloa and buried him in the soft earth. From that place sprung the first Taru. Ha'ohoku Ka'alani again mated with her father and had a living child who was named Haloa. Worship A woman's temple called Hali Opapa is the primary religious structure show associated with worship of this goddess. Hail O Papa are often built in connection with Luakini, or men's temples, places of official ceremony which are primarily dedicated to the gods Ku and Lonu. Although it is believed by many practitioners that they may also exist independently. In the Aloha An Ena movement, Papa is often a central figure, as her spirit is that of the life-giving, loving, forgiving earth who nurtures human life, and who is being abused by the misdeeds of mankind, especially in regard to the abuse of nature. Okay, and then we've got one more. This is Sumerian, and it's Namu. Namu, a highly regarded female deity, gave birth to Anna. An and Ki, we talked about, the gods of heaven and earth. She embodied the primeval sea, playing a major role in the creation of the world and serving as the mother goddess. That's Namu. Okay, and that is it for our deep dive on these primordial goddesses. Please give me a sub, a like if you got through this far and you enjoyed it and I and you feel like I'm giving you good information and you're learning something. Um, that really helps my channel to grow, helps me to be shown to more people. So if you comment or click like real quick or any of those things, sub, they all help me to grow my channel, get seen by more people and uh, which gives me um, the benefit of just knowing that people are watching, I'm doing something worthwhile. So thank you so much. Please join us next time. I appreciate you. Have a good day.